So welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. Thank you all for coming, for coming out uh, to um, the new Black Fest, a festival created by Keith with, with us, Joseph Atkins, on unapologetic humanity and accountability. I think it's a great theme and we are honored um, to have Keith with us again. We have a, a long history going back many, many years, almost a decade, I feel. It feels like, yeah. Yeah, and uh, with many really br brilliant events um, um, that um, um, Keith put together, and we are always thrilled to have him here to 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 learn and to be also inspired um, from the work. So welcome to all of our viewers on HowlRound. This is a live streamed on national nonprofit uh, uh, theater platform HowlRound. So we are thrilled to be um, on there. I would like to say thank you to all of you coming out uh, on this uh, kind of beautiful day here in New York. One of the first nice days, but for the actors and audience, so the artists to participate and for you to come out here. And um, if you have a cell phone, maybe just take it out and check if it's off or do the same. Okay. This looks good. We at the Siegel Center, we bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater, but we have all strong ties to the New York theater and we believe in the, you know, the theater that it's part of the city, it changes the city. We have the Prelude Festival and many things, so the work of the Black Fest really is close to us. And again, um, to uh, Keith, congratulations on all the work he did in the time of Corona, what he did in that time, I think with everybody involved is truly outstanding. It's a model uh, for all of us. We gave you a Siegel Center Prelude Award for the yes. work you did. Thank you. And, um, and so really, uh, thank you. It's an honor to have you all here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Appreciate you in the Siegel Theater. So thank you everyone for being here uh, this evening. Um, I wrote a little something I'm gonna share with you. Um, Cause you know, I can't memorize them anymore cause Zoom has yeah. jacked up my brain. <laughs> um, but uh, my name is Keith Joseph Atkins. Um, I am the curator of this event and also the artistic director of the new Black Fest. And I thank you for attending this evening's event. Um, the late novelist, Toni Morrison once said, I want to remind all of us that art is dangerous. I want to remind you of the history of artists who have been murdered, slaughtered, imprisoned, chopped up, refused entrance. The history of art, whether it is in music or written or what have you, has always been bloody because dictators and people in office and people who want to control and deceive know exactly the people who would disturb their plans. So let me explain why you were invited to this. Um, there's a lot going on in our world right now. From my vantage point, and I'm certain yours, from Gaza to Haiti, to climate change, to Sudan, to mental and psychic anguish, to the immigrant crisis, to human trafficking, to fascist plans of Trump's advisor, Stephen Miller. And the common denominator in all of these issues is the question of humanity and accountability. What does humanity look like right now? How are people demonstrating humanity? The same for accountability. Does that still even exist? And if so, what does it look like? So the artists and thinkers you'll experience this evening are people who I have a track record with, and they also have a track record of examining these very things. They're equally invested in the humanity of them, their own lives and the humanity of the world unapologetically. And that's why they are here and that's why we are all here. Unaccountable humanity, unaccountable accountability. Thanks for being here. And tonight you're going to hear showings and words and rhythms from Saeed Sirafazadeh, Ty Allen, Lisa Jesse Peterson, Winter Miller, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, you can definitely check the website for the specifics of who's here tonight and who's sharing, but please, by all means, open minds, open hearts, and let's change this jacked up place. <laughs> all right, thank you. I know. He hasn't paid us yet, so I'll be nice to him. Mm -hmm. 
One day, my mother, I went to get some water from the river below, and on that day, my father took her home to America. So began a cycle we call her. So began a cycle we call. One day my mother went to pick some cotton from the fields below. And on that day my father invaded her soul. So don't you know, so began my cycle in the So began my cycle in the One day my father went to get the rifle from daddy's window cause on that day my father tried to sell her son. I'm her only one. So began my daddy's cycle in hell. So began my daddy. Oh, so began my daddy's cycle, and so began. And the water ran low this evening, unlike most nights when the water runs so high, no matter how bright the moon shines or how many torches happen to be used, we can escape undetected through the woods like goblins or ghouls or the undead of countless tales of where we capture and thus resell. And we traveled, and we traveled through the deep dark, filling the mark for marks pointing north to our next stop, cause light and visibility are a problem to us. They mean we capture and death to us, but God had mercy upon us by making our skin a perfect master to darkness. Niggas at night have that complexion protection moving to and above the Mason-Dixon. Yeah, niggas at night have that complexion protection, moving to and above the Mason-Dixon, trying to become Canadians. And we moved from the sounds of gunshots and dog barks and hounds who sniffed us faster and faster, faster and faster, faster and faster away from master's own henchmen, and of course, the poor white trash posing as hunters, who held worries stick like once. They want to see us in chains and shit, church ventilated by bull bud, cane or oak sticks, but we hit from galvers racing to and fro, trying to find one of master's lost souls in hopes of returning it home for a fee, but we move faster and faster, faster and faster, faster and faster away from master's own henchmen and the poor white trash posing as hunters, because any slower meant a return to the undead state Thus the slower kill themselves or we were forced to kill them ourselves so they cannot be forced to give us away. But tonight I pray, new moon in space, we shall be safe because the niggas at night have that complexion protection. Slaves and Africans at night have that complexion protection. Moving to and above the Mason Dixon, trying to become Canadians. Africans at night, because Africans and I have that complexion protection moving to and above the Mason Dixon trying to become Canadians. Peace. Marika and Hawa are at an aid tent in a refugee camp. Hawa enters wearing a toque with another scarf so only her eyes are visible. Thank you for coming. What is it like to be a reporter? Oh, 
Well, uh, it's fulfilling. <laughs> I see a lot of places, meet a lot of people, so it's always interesting. And I guess I hope I do some good. What is the New York Times like? Everyone is in one skyscraper together? Well, there's the main building in New York City, plus international bureaus and others across the U.S. It must be very competitive to get hired. Everyone is from Harvard? <laughs> Not everyone, thank God. <laughs> I used to fantasize about being a reporter. Why didn't you? Do you have children? No. A husband? No. You make a great reporter. You ask the right questions. Did you go to university? Yes, cartoon. What did you study? Literature. Was that unusual for a woman in your family? My father was a sheik. He believed in education. I was an English teacher. Can you tell me about when you were arrested at the clinic? That is someone else, not I. The uh, medical report said Hala. The last name is blurred slightly, but it looks like Ahmed. The chart says the victim is pregnant with a laceration in her leg. All of that is common. It says she speaks English. That is not uncommon. And she is from Carnoy. Uh, most Americans don't, don't know there's a genocide in Darfur. A story like yours is what holds the feet of Western leaders to the fire. Why are you only interested in me? This camp is full of people, and you can't find another story? If you ask me, I think then you must be a very bad reporter. I'll tell you, it's very crass. Our readers are affluent. Remarkably few care what happens to Africans. So why pick you? Because you're well-educated. Because you're, of all things, an English teacher. You'll become more than another faceless refugee. If people see themselves in you, the sense of there but for the grace of God go I, they won't turn away. You must be a very fine writer. It's not my writing. It's your story. Nobody knows what's happening here. I just learned that the Sudanese Ministry of Women revived an old Sharia law. Any pregnant woman without a husband will be flogged, jailed, and forced to give her baby to an orphanage. You are threatening me with this? Absolutely not. I would never threaten you. I, I meant it's getting worse every day. You came to meet me. There must be some part of you that wants to talk. I wanted to meet a New York Times reporter in the flesh. That is all. Hawa, please. I will tell you on condition of total anonymity. That includes Dr. Carmen. I will protect your identity. Just to be seen talking to you, I risk my life. If I don't file a story in the next two days, my editor sends me out of here. Darfur doesn't get coverage. I don't know when I'll get a visa back in. What happened in Carnoy? I was teaching a lesson on the verb go. One of my students, Abdel, is confused. Tomorrow I went with my brother to play. A man rips the curtain, shoots Abdel in the head. His skinny body crumbles. He says, boys here, girls there. He beats Faza with his gun. She staggers and falls. Her brother Raman screams, and another answered with quick bashes to his tiny face. There were 18 children that day, seven boys and 11 girls. One by one, he shoots my boys. There is a row of stunned girls who cannot bear to look at these dead boys just moments ago, conjugating the verb go, go. Going, gone. They march the girls and women out, and we stand in a long line. There are no men in line? They are shooting men and boys. The Janjaweed shoves so many bodies in the well, it overflows with arms and legs. Mm -hmm. 
The water is poison. What do the Jajaweeds say? Are they yelling something? They call us Zerga, Nuba, dirty black slaves. After they line up the women, what happens? They pick women and girls out of lines. I hear Akbena, one of my students, scream for me. I cannot look up. I am holding my sister's hand, something we have not done for years. She is pulled in one direction. I am dragged off in another. That is the last I will see of her or any of my family alive. There are six men who take turns with me. When they are finished, I do not know. I remain on the ground as they left me because I am terrified to be found alive. When I open my eyes, I am covered in dried blood, but I do not know whose. It is mine. There is a swollen red slash across my leg. Each night I bury my family as I find them. I recognize my husband by a piece of his shirt. He is face down in his own blood with his pants at his ankles. My son, they have smashed his skull to pieces. Each dawn I hide in the bush. There is such silence. I see the dead walk, but I cannot say if it is a hallucination or if I collapse and wait for death. I pray for nothing else. Inside the camp, I wake up in the hospital. I am assembling the events that brought me here to this bed, this sheep, this doctor. He is asking me if I know I am pregnant. This is irreconcilable. Is this baby the last I will have of my husband? Or will this child look nothing like him? His face, always a reminder. Marika photographs Hawa, wrapped in her trope. Marika is in the desert. Dan is in her office. Getting back to her, how does she know it's six men who raped her? That's what she said. She probably counted. But there was no one else with her? No one who can corroborate? Everyone's dead or scattered. I trust her. She didn't want to tell the story. What if she's in her truth? Are we really going to have this conversation? I'm not saying it's not gruesome. It's just accuracy is paramount. She's not embellishing. This is what's here. This is her account. But she's far from alone. The witnesses are dead. Her entire family has been murdered. Six men raped her. She's pregnant. Does she know if it's her husband's baby? No. You need a sentence about that in the story. What's the victim's name? You can't print it. I want to use her first name. You have her photo. Her face is mostly hidden. We give American rape victims the right to a pseudonym. How is this different? It's a common name. You said so yourself. She could be killed. We can anticipate a rebuttal from the Sudanese government denouncing this as lies. The more we have in print legitimizes her story. You are not on the ground here. You think people aren't sensitive to another Yusuf Mali debacle? Not on my watch. This is not what that was, and I am not that reporter. She's not a composite. That's why, it's why I'm protecting her identity. You get that this story calls into question the involvement of the Sudanese government in something that hasn't yet been called anything worse than a humanitarian crisis. You have to be unbiased here. You think it's genocide, but it's not your call to make, obviously. I am not making the call. I'm pointing out the facts. That I don't want slack for false names or exaggerated facts. Nothing is exaggerated. Everything specific is confirmed. We don't have corroboration on the number of men who raped her, but we do know her first name. This conversation is ludicrous. You do realize that, right? This is part of tighter news standards. Attribution. This is an exception. This story will crack this wide open. 
Do you want to sit here and argue about it, or do you want to get to do you want to get to our floor on the front page? Your call. I have stories out of Burma and Venezuela I could front and share. Her name is Hawa. Hmm. <laughs> 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 Mamma. Mamma har ju tagit. Mamma. Nu nu låter mig vara okej. Nu låter mig vara.
Hi, everyone. So Keith gave me permission to break the fourth wall. Hope that's okay. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from my memoir called When Skateboards Will Be Free. And um, it's about growing up in the uh, Socialist Workers Party. And uh, before I do, I just want to take a see if any folks here know the Socialist Workers Party. Have we ever been walking down a street in New York City with a folding table and uh, books and somebody maybe came up to you, Ty, yeah, and they're trying to sell you a copy of the, the Militant? Do we know that? Who, okay. Who bought it? What? <laughs> Nobody bought the Militant? Okay, well, welcome to my childhood. Um, we were convinced that uh, there was going to be a working class revolution, and um, we're, we're still waiting for that. So I'm just going to read a, a brief excerpt. When I was four years old, there arose one morning an unresolvable crisis between my mother and me. I was in my bedroom playing with my toys when she entered and knelt beside me on the floor. We will not be eating grapes or lettuce anymore, she said. I put down my toys and looked up into her face. It seemed out odd and outlandish, this sudden rule, the kind of rule that comes from nowhere, out of nowhere, made solely at the whim of the adult world. That's a dumb rule, I said. It's not a dumb rule, my mother said. And she went on to patiently explain that the rule was not her own, but the rule of the Socialist Workers Party, which was itself following the rule of Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, who had called for a national boycott of table grapes and iceberg lettuce. All of this she described in the simplest of terms that allowed me to understand and accept the edict. You're such a good boy, she said, and she kissed me on the top of my head. As the days passed, however, and the boycott carried on, I found that my desire for grapes began to eclipse my compassion for the workers. Now it was my turn to interrupt my mother one morning. I'm ready to eat grapes, I said. I said it as plainly as she had. You can't eat grapes, she said. You know that. And then she added, and you can't eat iceberg lettuce. I don't want to eat iceberg lettuce, I responded brightly, thinking that she would see this as a welcome compromise. Well, you can't eat that either, she said with measure, adult with child, adult instructing child. I detected, though, somewhere beneath her rational exterior an undercurrent of satisfaction. I want to eat grapes, I said. You can't eat grapes, she said. And then I screamed, I want to eat grapes, I want to eat grapes. And I melted to the floor, rolling onto my back. I want to eat grapes. Well, you can't eat grapes, the light and airy voice said. And you can't eat iceberg lettuce. From there on, the absence of grapes became a constant, unyielding presence in my life. It seemed I was never far from a political poster about not eating grapes or a leaflet or a t-shirt or a conversation or a forum. I descended into a state of perpetual yearning that intertwined so tightly with my desire that it soon became impossible to distinguish one from the other and that established a terrible equation for me. Desire equals yearning. All of this culminated in the button my mother made me pin to my jacket, which featured the logo of the United Farm Workers, a black eagle with wings spread wide against a blood red background, along with the unequivocal imperative, don't eat grapes. I interpreted this not so much as an entreaty to the outside world as a scarlet letter to remind me of my own sinful desire, which, if ever quenched, would be through the immiseration of the workers. Is the boycott over yet? I would ask my mother, not yet, she'd say. When will the, bo when will the boycott be over? When the capitalists give the workers their rights? When will that happen? I don't know. When it happens, will we eat grapes? Yes. Weeks passed. Is the boycott over? No. Months passed. Is the boycott over? No. Fall came, then winter. Grapes were no longer in season. Is the boycott over? No. 
I had become that fox I had learned about in Aesop's fable, who jumped again and again without success at the bunch of grapes dangling on the branch above him. The story that the fox concocts in order to soothe himself and allay his disappointment is that the grapes themselves are most likely sour and not in the end worth his trouble. The conclusion I drew, however, was of a different nature. I began to see what my mother saw. The flaw was inside of me. Desire under capitalism was a shameful, unwanted condition, and one should never attempt to satisfy that desire, but instead, through heightened consciousness of the world, transcend it, and by so doing, rid oneself of it forever. Three blocks from our apartment in Brooklyn was the supermarket in which my mother and I would do our weekly shopping. This occasion presented a predicament for the two of us. Not only was I in close proximity to great mountains of grapes, but I was also keenly aware that my neighbors, most of them poor, would effortlessly and without any apparent compunction load up their shopping carts with the fruit. Look, Ma, I'd say, it's okay for us to eat grapes. No, she'd say, it's not. And once we had completed our shopping, I would have to stand beside her in front of the supermarket while she unzipped her knapsack and handed out an endless supply of leaflets with the black eagle, the red background, the three simple words. Then one day, after untold months of my ceaseless and unending demand, we were standing in the middle of the produce aisle when she said to me with obvious exasperation, eat one grape. I could not believe my good fortune. Immediately, I reached my hand up toward the piles towering above me, and I plucked without choosing. The grape was heavier than I remembered grapes to be. I popped it into my mouth and bit down. I chewed happily, violating the farm workers without remorse. Then three things occurred all at once. The first was that I realized how delicious the grape was, vindication of all the effort I had expended on obtaining it, the second was that I resolved this would not be the last time I was ever to, permitted to eat a grape. And finally, and most essential, I understood that the simple act of eating instantly rewrote the formula between desire and yearning, creating a new equation. Desire plus yearning equals theft. What was paramount for my mother, though, was that I had not breached the sanctity of the boycott. If anything, the supermarket took a loss on their investment and therefore, in an indirect way, thievery actually strengthened the struggle of the farm workers. Desire plus yearning plus theft equals revolution. The next time we were in the grocery store, my mother, now unable to turn back from the course of her decision, again allowed me to have a grape. The next time I ate without permission, I'm just having one ma, but I had two. After that, I ate three, so on and so forth. It became so habitual that I would stand leisurely in front of the mounds of grapes as if they were a buffet and I was considering my options. I would pluck casually as my mother shopped elsewhere in the store, my button informing the world to do the opposite of what I was doing. One afternoon, in the midst of my revelry with my mouth full and my hand reaching, I had the uncomfortable sensation that I was being observed. Not too, far, not too far away, an elderly woman was staring at me intently. I resented her interference in what I had come to think of as a private moment, and I stopped chewing. Go ahead, she said. Go ahead and eat another one. I wanted to follow her suggestion, but there was something in her voice that made me hesitate. Were her words really words of encouragement? I sensed that I was in danger of being entrapped by that indecipherable language of adult sarcasm. I, I peered at the woman who in turn peered at me. She had snow white hair and did not appear to have an unkind face. Perhaps she supported the boycott and therefore saw me as an ally championing the rights of migrant workers. It struck me suddenly how peculiar it was that an adult would actually endorse thievery and I somehow saw that I was following a peculiar set of rules. They were, of course, the correct rules, but they had set me in opposition to the rest of the world where my right was everyone else's wrong and where my, and where my wrong was everyone else's right. 
and where I would be helpless in ever being able to distinguish for myself which one was which. Thank you. Hashtag B, hashtag Fundum, hashtag uh, Cash Pig, hashtag Sub, hashtag. Uh, my favorite meet so far was definitely the one in New Orleans. I got to stay at the, the top of the, in the suite of the Lowe's Hotel, and I made like fucking five grand that weekend. That was insane. I mean, like, I wish I could have been saving now. Like, like, I wish I could have saved all the money. You know, sorry, I can't fucking think right now. I'm pretty uh, hungover. But I wish I could have saved all my money from all that because I made like, I blew like 60 grand, 70 grand. I have like 20. So, what can you do? Only make more, I guess. So, send me a tip. <laughs> oh, holy shit. <laughs> Judy, came, Judy came up and I, and you know, it's all that my shoulders and went, yeah. <laughs> I was not, holy shit, Peyton almost died. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Peyton, focus. What did you say? I caught a cramp. <laughs> on my legs. God damn it. Somebody's leg. No, hold on, let me take my shirt off. John, catch me if I fall. Dude, I'm okay. You gotta hold me up for a second. I can't, I can't. You got this. <laughs> you got this, man. You gotta, take, you gotta do that. Ah. Oh my Christ. Oh, there's children. Any sock sub? You want to see these socks? Let me see some money. You trying to get in this? Yes. Okay, dude. Thank you. And I want y'all to fucking like the fuck out of my life. Stay here and spam it. And while you're spamming it, fucking pay me. I want you to all go broke tonight. You haven't even paid the towels. Okay, then just tip me. Tip me fucking 20 right now, okay? Not doing shit y'all want till I see some cash out. Good. Fucking love it. Keep on sending. Which is a fucking example for all of you fucking betas. You should be all sending just like that. all doing what he is doing and serving us. Just like a good little loser. These feet are for you tonight. Just keep hanging in the way you're going to These feet are fucking yours right now. Just send it. Keep fucking sending all night long. Don't these fucking feet in the fucking face. I'm going to sniff and fucking worship. Yeah, that's what happens when you fucking send a tip is you get to worship these perfect fucking feet. Yeah, I like to see all that money coming Yeah, in. see? When you fucking pay, life's easier. When you it? pay me, you, fucking get, you, keep the, you keep fucking getting to see these fucking feet if you keep paying me. Keep us happy and satisfied with your fucking money. Because obviously it's not satisfying you enough. You want to see these cavities, you fucking weirdo? He wants to be owned. He wants to give me 10k a year. Yeah, that's what he said. AJ or Robert? 
I'm controlling his computer right now. This is his I'm gonna computer. Have, like, I'm going to wake up in the morning with like $700 in my account for no fucking reason whatsoever. We go from so we go from it just keeps going up from when I take it down. To his primary. He showed me how to do the, all, this to, all this stuff too. So it's like, boom, 1.2K. Right there. It's a money sound. Let's go. <laughs> This is just crazy. That's fucking great. You better put me in your fucking will, you stupid fuck. Oh, I will. I'll stick around. I love taking your fucking money. You are a worthless piece of shit. And I take what I fucking want. That's why I fucking make so much money. Yeah. Yeah, you can fucking come. You fucking nasty bitch. I'm, I was doing this in the parking lot of your work the other night, just taking it. Yeah, your 19 year old fucking master is going to make you fucking come, you disgusting fuck. <laughs> yeah, of course. That you get instantly weak and submissive every time you look at me, don't you? You have 3,656 subscribers, right? Yeah. Let's say 656 didn't end up subscribing, which is probably going to happen or more, but let's just do that. So. 42,000 a month times 12, 500, so $500,000 a year, not including like Twitter and stuff. That's just strictly just whatever. That's a give or take, you know? Okay, then do half that. Just like lowball the fuck out of it. Either way, divided by half of that. 252,000. That's more than like a whole family. It's more than some like surgeons work for their whole life. And it'll, I'll be making this like just sitting here posting every day. Like, you know. different like we're not it, i mean the, when you say sex work i think of like like our, like prostitutes no it's stuff. definitely sex work it definitely it, i don't know i don't know the, the meats are sex work the meats are sex, sex work, work but like it doesn't even matter if we're not doing anything them like praising our feet like licking our feet like in, like, like, like over like the phone it's, it's definitely not like, that's bro they're getting off of that like hard it's normal stuff. like yeah it's like i mean like it seems normal now like, but definitely like like i was like saying a year and a half ago none of this I'd have been I would have been like, I was like, fucking gay as when fuck. I, when I first heard of it, I was like, like, no way. What the fuck? Like, and also, a big thing about this is like, a lot of us don't know what we want to do with our lives. And so it's like, we don't, we aren't forced into a nine to five where we're, we're like, you know, trying to figure or college it out. where we have, college we have sure. to grind at something that building someone else's dream. I don't want to be 19 and broken college right now. Yeah, like, I could like be making a name. A lot of friends like that and they're fucking miserable. Oh. <clears throat> Who's my boyfriend? I make I do food pics. And I make makeup. And I love telling people what I do for a living. Dude, for real. It's so funny on their to get face. their reaction. Like, like, I'll, I'll do it for fun just for looks on their face. They get They're mad. like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I sell my feet. They're like, oh, funny. What do you like actually do? Like my mom. My mom will tell me, like, stop being feet. so lazy. Get out of bed. And I'm like, mom, I sell my feet. You work a huge. She works like. Eight eight hours a day at a nuclear plant, like uh, sometimes twelve hours a day, and I'm still doing more than.
responding as where should these body songs my bands this is my fucking money Think about your feet all day. They are the center of my universe. I fall to my knees and worship your feet every day. Um, fuck. I don't know why they fucking me. I think I'm a pretty average guy, honestly. These guys are just fucks. So I guess, I mean, compared to them, I am pretty great, <laughs> but God, I mean, everybody's like, nobody's perfect. And like some of these people are like, they have so much money and like so much power over other people. How the fuck do they not know that nobody's perfect? Why the, why the fuck do they think I'm perfect? I'm like, I sit around and I spent all my money on weed and weed accessories. <laughs> like, Push the music. Yeah, I almost have my AirPods. Let me see some fucking tips right now. I don't know. Just something not everyone does, and it's not normal. Whatever. If you're not like in society in these days, especially, it's normal for some people, but like old fashioned people for sure. Look down on it the most. I guess my stepdad would be like, just go out and get a job. So I don't have way more money doing this than anything else. This is dumb money. I've been sitting here just chilling and made almost grand. I made a grand a minute, pretty much. I'm making money right now talking. Do your parents know? Um, I don't know. I haven't talked to them in a few years, so it'd be hard to answer it. It'd be hard to know, but my family knows, and by that I mean more people I care about, which is John, Johnny, and my group. So that's all I need to know about. It. That's all I need to need to know. If that makes sense. I want to see more tips, so I'm going to end this live. You got money. You know, I'm smart. I can do whatever the fuck I want with my life. You know, whatever I put my mind to, I can accomplish. So I have a, I have a lot ahead of me. I'm excited for it. So but definitely a lot of money. I don't know. I'm definitely going to be a multi multi man. I just think about it like this. Ah. There's a billion ways to make money out there. <clears throat> Being broke is part of the game. Staying broke is not. 
part of the game of life. Being broke, that's part of you know everyone's everyone's born like that. I mean, unless you're just born rich, right? But I mean, like staying broke is not. I'm not. I, I'm choosing not to be broke. You know, because I've lived broke. That shit sucks dick. So yeah, but uh. Some more likes, some more tips, man. Some more viewers. We're down here for an hour. Okay. He's got a bunch of fucking followers on Twitter. How y'all doing tonight? Good, Glad you're here. Glad we're here. I can't shake what I'm feeling. I can't ignore my soul's cry. Watching the depths of depravity, the gaslighting, the deafening silence, everybody doing the mute challenge, folks fearful of economic retaliation, the cruelty, the indifference, it's all so mind blowing. Twilight Zone, bizarro levels, shit is wild. I'm an empath, I'm an artist, I'm a poet, but this is not a poem. This is all I got for now. Ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, cease genocide. Cease starvation, cease ethnic cleansing. The colonizer is no longer controlling the narrative. Social media has changed the game. The oppressed live streaming the truth of the colonizer's atrocities for all the world to see, even though they're desperately trying to tell us what we're seeing isn't what we're seeing, but their gaslighting sorcery has lost its grip. Gaslighting about genocide is not working. We see it clearly. We feel it deeply. We are not numb or dumb. We know what we're looking at. Scrolling through genocide while drowning in gaslight campaigns from the media, from the president, and state-run social media bot farms. <laughs> we know what we're looking at. We remember genocide. We remember apartheid, colonial terrorism, cellular memory coursing through our DNA. We remember lands snatched, people snatched, people slaughtered, ancient indigenous culture hunted, the earth people, sun people, black, brown, beautiful people. We were called savages, animals, vermin, and terrorists too. We remember fighting back. We remember fighting for freedom, fighting for our humanity, for our dignity, fighting for liberation and space on this big, beautiful planet. God placed us here. We belong. We remember state-sanctioned terrorism, the night Riders, the hooded ones, the lying ones, the psychopath sheriffs and cops, and the psychotic vigilante neighbors who wanted our land and just took it, wanted our bodies and just took us. 
wanted us dead and just killed us tortured our mothers, lynched our fathers, made the children watch. But they did love the dogs, only the dogs. We remember being bombed. We remember being burned alive. Pieces of our charred flesh kept as souvenirs. So yeah, we know what we looking at. We know genocide. We know white supremacy. Oh, do we know white supremacy? <laughs> we watch them cheer our death, scorching the earth with mountains of our bones as colonizers and occupiers embraced each other with billion dollar hugs and promises of something secret. Because war is a lucrative sport. We know what we're looking at. We know the colonizers and their flags. <laughs> we're ungaslightable, baby. This ain't no regular war. This genocide. World leaders have said it. The ICJ called it plausible. The world, the world is calling for a ceasefire. And yet the U.S., the U.K., and Germany are still supplying weapons to continue a genocide. Baby, woo, this rabbit hole of colonial settler land grabbing, resource plundering, culture erasing, ethnic cleansing with impunity is deep and sinister. Shit feels like I'm in a zombie movie with ghouls and vampires everywhere disguised in governments and corporations wearing expensive suits and military uniforms. Who are we sharing the planet with? See, colonizers stick together and support genocide and they'll call it anything but what it is because colonizers lie and will never admit to genocide while enjoying orgies of slaughter. Colonizers are white walkers, zombie-like Yorugu spirits that carry out anti-human barbarism. Colonizers are war pigs. Colonizers are greedy, repugnant, low vibrational entities who steal, kill, lie, and destroy. Colonizers are a cancer on the planet, a deadly disease a death cult that eats peace and indigenous freedom. These evil emperors running evil empires, they all have no clothes. <laughs> we know what we are looking at. Congo, Sudan, Palestine, Haiti, they're all connected. The common denominator is colonialism, land theft, resource plundering, imperialist, multinational greed, government-sponsored death cults. But the jig is up, Sammy. You and all your little colonizing white supremacy, genocidal thieving friends, I know like I know like I know like I know this is the end of an old, wicked, colonial, imperialist paradigm. This shit is crumbling at warp speed. Eh, they thought they had buried us, but they didn't realize we were seeds. Watch what emerges from the rubble. We, the people of the planet, are ushering in the next, the new. We must continue to fight. Keep rocking the globe with resistance until freedom, until peace, until balance, until liberation, until justice, until peace. We cannot afford to be silent. We the people have the power. We've already disrupted the colonizer's narrative. We gotta keep going, keep moving our feet, keep speaking up. Look at how our collective voice is already shifting things. God, I'm trying to ban TikTok and shit. <laughs> well, look at here. <laughs> we cannot afford to be silent. We cannot afford to be silent. We cannot afford to be silent. See, 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 see. My ancestors been talking to me loud these days. They say, child, this is how them 
them folks do? This the same wicked, low vibrational, greedy, spiritual infant we've been battling since before, since, ooh, since way before. This the wicked pale fox, Yerugu spirit. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know what you're dealing with. But don't you fret. We got your back. Stay vigilant. Keep resisting. Because this wickedness ain't normal and is definitely unsustainable. They are not winning, no matter what it appears to look like right now. 530 years, 400 years, 75 years, it's all just a blip of time in our dimension. Believe me when I tell you, we're gathering. We're already here. Mm -hmm. Yes, we ancestors are gathered spiritual squad on deck we hear your cries remember rome remember goliath remember was came in ceremony in haiti remember resistance remember the fall but most importantly remember your power Remember your mojo. Remember all of your collective voices can become the perfectly placed stone in the people's slingshot. <laughs> the pendulum is pulled all the way back and we're almost, just about almost ready to let it go. So stay prayed up. Keep moving your feet, keep speaking up, organize, strategize, be kind to one another, be fierce, be brave, help people, speak life, acknowledge the ancestors and expect miracles. Imagine the world you want to see after this wicked empire and mad men crumble. Imagine the sun rising on all your love and joy and peace and restored humanity on the planet. Remember that joy is a form of resistance. Laughter is medicine, laughter is medicine, laughter is medicine. It's how we maintain our humanity and win with righteous love and collective light. Our collective mojo will bring the light of a new world order with all the children laughing. <laughs> with all the children laughing. Listen for it. Imagine it. We are so much more than we've been told. All endings are beginnings for something brand new. So what you gonna do? Cause the shit is on, grasshopper. Imagine calling on alien intervention. The men in power have gone mad. Send Morse code to the Intergalactic Council of Planetary Peace and Alignment. Because we are in a state of emergency. I know your spidey senses feel this. And since we have been blessed, a tremendous alchemist, turn this thing around. Ring a bell, spit rum, beat the drum, burn sage, shake a tambourine, roll a coconut, blow smoke, sprinkle herbs, boil a pot, take a bath, chant, sing, clap in the clearing. I said, chant, sing, clap in the clearing, catch the ancestor spirit, catch the that's that spirit. Call on Shango, Oya, Yemen, your Obatala segment, Heru, Heru, Kuchira, Atan, Amra, and all of them. And then check your intentions and root it in love. Warp speed. Warp speed. Warp speed. Activate.
Vibration three. The search. Do you know her? I would like to know the whereabouts of my mother, Lucy Hatton. I have not seen her 28 years. I was born in Wilmington, Patty Hatton. I belong to John Stanley. I was sold West Philadelphia to a Negro trader by the name of Davis. He brought me and children to Petersburg. I left my husband in Wilmington. Some called him Peter Pickett. And some Peter Stan. He belonged to the Pickets who lived in Dublin County. My father had three children, and I am the oldest. I had one sister and a brother. My sister's name was Mary and Brother Wright. Do you know them? I have one I would like to know where about uh, some of my people or to locate Captain Dave. John Ritter, my father, James Dolmer, uh, Richmond, Virginia, was a soldier under Captain John Ritter and was killed while in the Army. My mother died when I was three years old. I had one sister. Miss Esther Stokes, color, living in Ripley, wants information of her son, Commodore Nelson Perry Sidwell Stokes. And that's right. Right away from Maysville, Kentucky. 13 years ago. Mr. Edgar, information is wanted of my eldest son, Charles Daniel Griffin. The next one was William Harrison Griffin. The next, Wesley Griffin. My daughter was Lavinia Griffin and their father, Charles Griffin, who used to belong to Billy Griffin. I belong to Dick Griggs. I was sold to William Browning before the war. I left them at a place eight miles from Cold Pepper Courthouse out in the country. Information wanted. My grandmother, whose name was Britta Payne, she was sent south just before the war and sold to a Negro trader named Hayden, who lived in Leon County, Texas. She left two children, Amanda Payne, my mother, Information my uncle, Ashe. Isaac Sumner, Ashe. last heard of, who left Galveston, Virginia, between any information years concerning her will be thankfully. The last heard of was false information. Information wanted in relation to the whereabouts of one colored man named Benjamin Franklin Colbert. I say, son of the hardy Colbert, I say. Mr. Ed, it appears that the whereabouts of my six children, whom I left in Carroll County, Mississippi, the first year of the war. We all belong to Mr. Stephen Burks. He died in the fire. And Mr. Pratt took some of my children. And Mr. King, daughter, as for Mr. Editor, their father died. I have decided to know the whereabouts of my six children, whom I left in Carroll County, Mississippi, the first year of the war. We all belong to Mr. Stephen Burns. He died, and we were divided, and then Mr. Platt took some of my children, and Miss Eugene, daughter of S. Burns, took the rest. My husband, my father died. My father, my mother, Tom Payne Williams, and Susan Williams. Mr. William Alberton, please give me some information on my parents. You were the last person to see me. Address Jerusha Williams, fourth alley between Congress and Jefferson Streets, Georgetown, D.C. Information one. Information one. Information one. Information one. Information one. Mr. Editor, I desire to know the whereabouts of my six children, whom I left in Carroll County, Mississippi, the first year of the war. We all belong to Mr. Stephen Burks. He died and we were divided. And Mr. Pratt took some of my children. And Miss Eugene, daughter of S. Burks, took the rest. My husband, their father, died. Wiley Parker bought me and brought me to Texas. The names of my children were boys, Daniel, Toby, Nelson. Walker, girls, Josiah, and Silly. We lived three miles from Middletown, Mississippi, on Mr. Davis's plantation. Address me. Care of Mr. C. H. Graves, San Felipe, Texas. Share. <laughs>
Two days later, Hamida finds Hawa outside the clinic. Victor. Bandages, Tylenol, antiseptic, a bucket of sterile water, pep kit in the blue box. Hamida and Carlos wash blood and dirt from Hawa. Hamida cleans Hawa's groin and thighs. Hey, 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 no sudden moves, okay? I want you to hear something. He brings the stethoscope to her ears. Hear that? It's fast, twice as fast as yours. It's a what, 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 what? Hawa listens to her second heartbeat. Take me to Chad. We'll talk when you're feeling better. This baby is all I have. I promise we'll talk about it. Just get some sleep. Time passes. Carlos remains by Hawa's bedside until morning. Marika enters, but keeps her distance. How is Hawa? How is she? Does she look okay to you? Is her baby okay? What did I say the very first time I saw you? I said, be careful with the repercussions I for listened them. because- No, you don't listen to anyone. Not if it isn't what you want to hear. Look, I came here- To get on the front page. You profit off her. What does she get? Beaten and raped. I didn't need this to happen to Hawa. I I'm not finished. I've seen 13-year-old girls who have had guns shoved inside them. When you think you've seen it all, an American idiot walks in and makes the cycle repeat itself. I am trying to stop the cycle. You're only seeing one side of us. Rika, you knew the risk she took, but still you put her name and her phone I out. did. It's not a decision that was made lightly. If I hadn't done that... Then what? That story wouldn't have been in the paper at all. If the story... Well, what is that? Your, your justification? I don't have to justify. You're there a was... top flight reporter, but I'm supposed to believe that something you didn't want to... Get in the paper, yes. got in? Yes, wake up. It happens all the fucking time. Everything is a compromise. This is how it works. Was it worth it? I don't know. In terms of what happened to Hawa, no. And I'm sorry, but for what you're doing here, for what I'm doing here, I risked harm to one person in order to draw attention that could save hundreds, maybe more. I hope that's worth it. I'm here day in and day out at people's bedsides trying to put them back together. But you parachute in for a couple days. You don't. You show up with power and privilege. And regardless of your intentions, you've got Hawa's blood on your hands. You got the story. What are you still doing here? Leave. Janja weed. Janja weed. Yeli Sote Hajimilo Kegere Bati. Two villages were attacked just north of here. Lekebe Giri Kare. They're coming here. What did she say? Two villages north of here were attacked. When? She says they're coming here. Who? John Shuid or victims? Okatire. Kitia. Has anyone come from there? Mm -mm. Nay. Kidagi Buruyo. No, not yet. My brother is missing. The Janjaweed will come. They're not going to come in the camp. You're, you're safer here than anywhere else. They will come. We will be killed. Take me to Chad. The sound of horse hooves galloping over sand. That's coming closer. Hawa, can you walk? Yes. Get me out. I'll take you to Chad. Carlos, wait a second. You can't. If you're caught in an FRD vehicle, FRD will get kicked out of Darfur. I, I, I don't know what else to do. Well, take my car. Let's go. Uh, how do we get Hawa across the border? We'll pretend she's my wife. She can speak English. I, I, I don't know. We'll think of something. What about Hamida? Can she speak English? No. We can't take her. What's going to happen to Hamida? Lohori Tare. Where are we going? Marika's right. I'm sorry. Leiliri. What is he saying? We, we, we gotta go. Now. Berkita. Solemu. I take you. Arka chale lili, lori ke keyege. Please, where will I go? Eran, eji laho. I'm not in control. Ayele, I will be killed. Late jalele. Hide and wait. Come on. What are the roads like? I have no idea. Bakar jale lili, please. 
Shots are fired. Dodger weed shout. Donkeys bray. And the camp is plunged into chaos. Clap for everything you heard tonight, please. Life sets up. So my day job is I'm a jazz singer and a poet. And my fun job is I advise more left-leaning progressive politicians in America and conservatives. Let's just say I don't like my fun job. This is not really fun. But I um, also consult with a lot of, um, I advise a lot of um, CPO heads around um, the country. But I mention that because the one thing I've learned by being a performer and also doing the other work is um, I figured out that, in my own head anyway, that the you, all, you do this for a reason. And I'm not really into peace. Peace is, peace is often... Um, a mislabeled word for niceness. Um, it's like saying someone is nice versus kind. I'd rather kind over nice. Nice feels cheap. It feels it feels lazy. Kind, kind requires a, a commitment to be kind to someone. You have to really want to be something you're kind. Peace is kind of like that too. Love though, or resistance, or justice, or revolution require commitment. Requires you to want to do something. You have to want to be revolutionary. You're the one to resist. You have to want to be in love. My brother says um, in his relationship, and I have adopted this too, that you have to wake up every morning to be in love. It's the actual thought. You have to go, I want to be in this situation. I want to be in this band. I want to be in this relationship. And we were trying to figure out what song to end with. And he kept pushing this one song. And I was like, no, nah, it doesn't work. And then hearing what we were doing today, he's right. It does work. Okay, you once for once on the stage, you were correct. <laughs> He's the youngest member of our band, so I, I give him a hard time. Um, but one day he's gonna be a famous composer, so I have to be nice to him so I can keep working. <laughs> it's gonna be really table turned in a few years. And so we chose St. James Infirmary because it is one of the oldest jazz songs, period. But what's unknown is that it is a result of three oppressed communities. It's a result of an Irish song that happened during the occupation of the British. It's a result of Appalachian black and white workers who are dealing with the corporations who are basically controlling the um, coal mines and a result of what was happening in um, New Orleans. And it's a song about love, but also about losing love and coming to terms with your own mortality, but still reminding yourself that, hey, I had a great thing going. I thought that kind of fit this after you can convince me so all right cool i hate explaining things but i felt this one to explain i really do hate my job mm -hmm. though except the art part mm -hmm. Folks are went down St. James and Fernray See my baby out there Stretch out on a long white table So sweet, so cool, so fair Let her go, let her go, and God bless her. Wherever she 
may be. All oh, sick and search is wide, we're over. But she never find a man like me. 17 go to the graveyard. 17 will hear this song. 17 will go to the graveyard. But only 16 will come back home. So when I die, trust me in my straight lace riches. A box bag coat and a Stetson hat. Put a twenty dollar gold piece on my watch chain. Oh, solo fellas, no, I die standing high. Six scrap shooting barbarians. Some cars, girls, to move, to move me along. Great white horse to guide me a second line to bring me home. Seventeen will go to the graveyard. Seventeen will hear their song. Seventeen will go to the graveyard, but only sixteen. We'll come back home. Oh, we'll come back home. Now, now, now you heard my story. Hey, boy, give me another shot and boo, woo, woo, woo. And if anyone should ask you, I got to St. James Infirmary. St. James Infirmary. St. James Infirmary. Blue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, we are about to have a quick Q and A, um, and why we bring some chairs up here for the uh, creatives and the thinkers that we're sharing tonight. Um, I just want everyone to give another round of applause for the incredible work that we saw tonight. Um, I want to shout out some of the actors: uh, Portia, who was in Winter Miller's In Dar Four, Pascal Armand, Michael McIntyre. Um, Antoinette Lavecchia had to leave, um, but we thank her for all the work that she was able to do. Um, another round of applause for Lisa Jesse Peterson, Saeed Serafazade, Ty Allen, and Ian Ford. Um, so yes, can you come on up folks? Uh, Lisa, Saeed, Winter, Rob Fields, who was our guest panelist. Everybody should have a mic, hopefully. Uh, so I got one. I think you can share. Yeah, you can share. Yes. 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 Everybody good? Okay, great. All right. Again, thank you all for being here and just sort of like having this exchange around this theme of unapologetic accountability and unapologetic humanity. Um, so let's, uh, let's do this. Um, Wait, can we first congratulate you on bringing all of us together? That was a terrible clapping. Let's try this again. Can we thank Keith for bringing us all together? Woo! Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Um, thank, thank you, Ty. Thank you. Um, I like you sometimes too, bro. Um, but, um, 
so many incredible things that were shared um, tonight, including the films, um, Jonathan McQuarrie's um, amazing uh, meditation on Black people post-emancipation looking for family members. Um, Natalie um, Alvarez Messin's uh, Letting Go, and uh, and I think it was uh, Faith, Faith Saka's um, Alpha Kings. <laughs> um, so a lot to sort of unpack, but I just want to begin with um, what does humanity mean and look like to you today, Lisa? And is there and is there evidence of it? Does it exist? Well, it, it, that's a layered question <laughs> um, because there's layers to humanity. But I think for me in this moment, humanity looks like life and always affirming life. And humanity is um, shared um, shared resources, shared planet, shared home. We live in this home. This is a home. So humanity is about how do we live in this home and affirm life together. Thank you. Thank you. Rob Fields. Same question, huh? Same question. Uh, I think the first part of your question is, is there humanity? And I, I have to say, yes, I say this as, um, I said one of the things that, that I've said in many different circumstances is that if you have kids, you have to be optimistic about the future. And, you know, we want a world in which our children can thrive and, and, and we want to envision a future in which they are safe and whole and, you know, have, you know, resources and, not, and access to opportunities. So, yeah, I, I I want to be optimistic about the future. I am encouraged by the fact that people are working really hard against such sort of systemic recalcitrance to reaffirm humanity. And humanity is not just about love, I think. It is about the presence of justice and reaffirming that there are so many more of us who understand what justice looks like and needs to look like. It needs to be brought back into focus. Um, and, and, you know, it's not going to be easy, but I believe that it will be achievable at some point. I just hope, as many people have alluded to up here, that it can happen before there's more there's before there's more loss of needless loss of life more injury more continuation of the cycles of you know you know violence and the attendant responses that only beget more violence and we're just caught in some endless like you know global Hatfields and McCoy situation and everything so I'm, I'm hopeful but it, it's not going to be soon, um, you know, yeah, realistically hopeful, hopefully realistic. I don't know. Right. <laughs> uh, winter. Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, same question? Yeah, same question. <laughs> I feel well, like I mean, we, I'm, I'm, I feel I'm, like we covered it. <laughs> no, we did not cover it. Well, I mean, in particular, I'm asking you because you wrote in Darfur after your experience as a journalist in continental Africa, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, I think the thing to do is always just check who are you harming and to try to harm as few people as possible. Um, I was laughing during your grape story because <laughs> we had the same thing. Uh -huh. And I remember saying to my mom, like, they're not gonna know if I do it. They're not even no. They can't see me, and um. But but it's that it's it's looking around and seeing, um, are my needs met? How much more do I need of what these needs are? Are they met? Am I good? Okay. How about everybody else? Are their needs met? What does it take to meet those needs? How far is the gap between them? Um. I think the the problem of being disparate and being in a mass country is that it is not easy to 
um, to love our neighbors. We often don't know them. Um, we often don't trust them. And uh, the same for them with us. But in a small town, you can see a lot more of that humanity. Um, but I basically think it's just, um, it's reaching out. It's looking people in the eye. It's just showing up. It's being present. It's saying, this hurts. This is bad. I'm right here. Because we're not changing it. We're just living in it. And we have to go through whatever those paths are to get to wherever we're going. And what we're in now is no different than what we've always been in. Mm -hmm. So I'm not thinking, oh, that's going to change. I'm just thinking, what are the possibilities for looking at things differently so that we can make it better for as many people as possible? Thank you. Appreciate that. Saeed and then Ty. Can I get a can I get a different question? <laughs> How am I going to answer this, kid? I can say the sentence backwards. The question backwards. <laughs> so was it? So it's two parts. What is, I'm sorry. What is humanity? Was that one of them? Well, you can answer either or. Well, it was well, a compound question. I'm but, sorry. What, what was it? And what was well, the, the question? Is like, what does humanity mean to you? Okay. What does it look like to you? Okay. And do you think it exists? And do you think do I think evidence it exists? Of it? So you can uh, answer that all that question. You can, can, can this be evidence of humanity Absolutely. right here? Okay. Good. Answer. Okay. So we got that down. <laughs> okay. So that we. Um, because I feel like just us being here, this is this is a good a good example. Um uh I'm trying not to be an asshole. You know what I'm saying? Like, what can I do? What can I do? What small things can I do? Um, I don't always succeed. Uh here, I'll give you this is gonna seem like the most minor example. I play basketball. I get mad when I lose. And Oh, I'm the only one. <laughs> um, and uh, right. Um, and uh, but the other day I observed this. I observed this. Uh, this one young man, he lost he lost the game and uh, he went over and he congratulated the other team. And I and I saw that. So here this is going to be two parts. First was I saw I said I, I saw what he did. He lost, but he, he went over and congratulated. And then I went over to him. And I congratulated him. I said, I saw what you did. And I said, that takes some heart. I don't have that. Anyway, it was such a small moment, but I feel like, I don't know, that feels like that goes that goes a long way. Yeah. It goes a long way. Yeah, it can be micro and very- Please, yeah. And macro. Right, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Because I can't handle the macro. Right. Right, I can't. <laughs> Sometimes all you can do is the micro. Yes, Ty. You get mad when you lose basketball too? All the time. <laughs> um. I, well, when I had two knees, I could say that. I only have one knee now, so I now talk trash from the corner going, back in the days, you know, I would have taken you. Ouch. Um, <laughs> ouch is more ouch than when now. Um, I, I don't know how to answer. Which, what hat am I wearing? Politic hat or poet hat or person hat? Whatever hat you want to wear. I mean, I feel like... Uh, so... It's 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 hard for me to answer that question. It's what are, humanity? Yes, humanity is there because food, food, shelter, and clothing is the basic principles of humanity. It's it's to see the species exist um, beyond its own fall its own fallacies and valuables, right? But then, I work in a place. I I excuse me. I part time work in a place where I hate everyone. And I'm saying this, and anyone who knows me and, and knows I work part knows I hate everyone except two clients because everyone lies. And I hate politicians the way I hate billionaires because politicians and billionaires exploit the people. So it's difficult for me to say that humanity is something where I, I want to I wanna kick over the can till we can find humanity. I want it to disrupt things. I'm, I'm, I'm probably the... You can't, I can't be an elected because I'm probably gonna walk into him going, I hate all you blankety blanks. Why don't you all just quit and go kill yourselves? Um, <laughs> but I can't do that. And so I feel as if I spend a lot of my time band-aiding um, cutlass and bullet wounds. Everything, I, every time I fix something, 
someone comes along and ruins it. We talk about the emotional response units. We doing the the, um, the marches in 2020, we got it done. And then the mayor has never funded it properly until supposedly recent. Then you wonder why there's so many emotional challenges on the train. If the response units were properly funded, it might be less. So did I actually win a victory? Or did I put a Band-Aid on something? And so I get, I and then this is a family business. We've been doing this since the slave ship, literally working against oppression. At this point now, I'm like, man. And then my kids are doing this. Like, ah, they want to be like, yeah, that's great. But I don't think that's great. My kids should not be having the same conversation that my mother did in the 50s. There's something wrong with that. And I know we celebrate the revolutionary. We celebrate the avid. Yeah, I, for a long time, none of my friends knew I worked in politics. Because I didn't think it was anything grand. I hated it. But I just don't know any better. I still want to spot. It's kind of like basketball. I have one knee, but I still go play. I have one eye open, and I still go and do this work, which is why I I stay in the arts so I don't take clients I really hate. I know friends who work in politics are strategists. And they got to work with Andrew Yang. I won't do it. I can't do those kind of people. So I'd rather make art because I love making art, and it also keeps me away from losing my humanity in the work that I do. I mean, you know, Pulling from from that statement, um, Toni Morrison, who I will always quote, um, she I was reading an interview with her and someone maybe from like four or five years ago, and they called her up at home and she was saying that she was unable to write. She was able, unable to move through a new novel because she was so overwhelmed by the politics of the country and the global politics of the world. And the friend allegedly said to her, well, actually now is the time to actually activate yourself, like push through this sort of um, uh, sort of darkness that you're feeling and create. And so then on the B side of that, she has this famous quote of now is the time, I, I'm paraphrasing, but now is the time artists must sort of step forward in the world. And this is the time that you should be active and do your thing. And so I say all that as a preface to ask you all, what do you feel like you should be doing as an artist or an arts administrator or arts um, person right now in the world with all the many things that are happening? Um, and there are many, many things happening, right? It's almost like there's no way you can turn anymore. Like a couple of friends of mine said to me a decade ago, they were intuitive readers, so-called psychics. And they said to me like within the next 15 years, the world's gonna be moving so fast that not one person on the planet can turn in any direction and not see the problem. And that they also need to be able to be accountable for whatever they're seeing, right? So I, <laughs> I don't know if you can front how you want to, but just let me ask the question first. So answer the question at least, <laughs> Rob. What, what does that mean to you? If thinking about Toni Morrison's sort of prompt what is artists or arts administrators? What what should we be doing? What should be doing? What should we be doing? And what should they be doing? What is art? What is what should art look like right now? I, I've I've talked about this and and written a little bit about this. You know, now we are in the midst of you know these systems that are collapsing. We are seeing a massive failure of imagination in any number of areas. And one of the things that we have not tried, you know, we have this political divide, we have, you know, gender divides, we have all kinds of, you know, misinformation, miscommunication, you know, we have a crumbling educational system, we don't teach civics anymore, yada, 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 yada. The one thing that we have not tried is a massive infusion of support into the arts to create things like this, spaces where people can come and have an experience, a creative experience that op begins to open up dialogue so people can talk, people can say, I used to see it like this, but now maybe my views have changed or that was cool, but I haven't changed my views and 
we could have some conversations about that, but we have gone so far down this social media rabbit hole where we were all in our own social media bubbles that anything outside of that, there is no cross ideological dialogue. And people sound quaint when they say, well, back in the day, you know, you used to be able to talk to Republicans, for example, more or less, you know, they, you know, more or less, but, you know, there is the thing that has been given such short shrift is the arts in this country because you can't take it public. You can't like make a billion dollars off of it and all that stuff. So, you know, anytime there's fiscal drama in a city, state, federal government, let's cut the arts budget. Like, like that's really going to balance your budget. But, and so, and, and what has happened is the arts have always gotten short shrift because it's supposedly not practical, but what the arts teach you, what you all have experienced here today, many of you here are practitioners, is arts open up the side of you that is about empathy and feelings. There was a book that came out just last spring called Your Brain on Art. Many of us know in, from the arts that, you know, arts contribute to, you know, greater sense of well-being and kids get higher math and reading scores when they have the arts and music and yada, yada, yada. Well, they finally took all this empirical information that people had and they did this sort of Johns Hopkins level research on it. Like they put the brain caps on people, put them in front of arts experiences and they could, be, they have data that the arts actually create better outcomes physically, mentally, emotionally, all of that. And again, we don't, haven't used that as a means of healing these deep rifts and opening up these conversations about justice, about equity, about you're not losing because we're making things right that were wrong. We are, you know, arts are the place that, I'm really gonna shut up in a second. Arts are the place where I think particularly people of color, black people, brown people, people in the global South, in the context of white supremacy and Western civilization have not gotten the thing that Esther Arma talks about, emotional justice. So we're always like, you know, you, we all know the difference between sorry and I'm really sorry. <laughs> You know, and when you don't get that, then you're still like always looking for that just real addressing of the hurt and harm that you've been called. But like the arts at least get you to a point where maybe after seeing some of these works here, if this were like a civic dialogue or something like that, people could say, you know what, I don't, I really, now I understand. I'm really sorry about. X, Y, and Z, but we don't even try in this country to do that. We don't even try to, you know, bring people together in that way. So anyway, go for it. So in the history, in the history of empires, well, I right, use oppression. Oppression works in Western, Western, Western society. Oppression works in four ways. It attacks black people, brown people, new immigrants, poor people, and to five, and then women. Those are five groups that attacks. Most of your great art comes from those five groups. Let's just keep us keep it a buck. In Western society, those five groups make your best art. Because usually, the art comes from the ground up. Now, there is something you said about institutional art, which often for a long time was um, a white man or a white man making the art down. If you want to stop a group of people from having any source of enlightenment, you destroy access to those five people to the arts. It's not by accident that you kill the poets first, you kill the musicians first, the professors who are on the left side of the fence first. It's not by accident you go to the places where the 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 quote unquote untrained artists are and you put them in jail. The um the the journalists who happen to be songwriters or the songwriters who happen to be teachers, it is by design. You don't fund the people that you want to inhibit. They never you never do. So I I I don't I've never in the history of my studies and teaching classes I can't think of a of a time period when an empire has funded its enemies. 
if someone can give me time period, I will take it and teach it next time to your class. I can't. The Romans didn't do it. The Brits definitely didn't do it. <laughs> and the Americans don't know how to do it. They rather strangle their own kind as well as other folks who come here. So you don't have an um, influx of intelligence and emotional intelligence around the arts. Because you always come, you always bring the artist into the conversation afterwards. We're going to build this bridge and then we're going to ask Lisa to perform on it. But the bridge will be between two KK groups. It's like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> they didn't ask Lisa to come in and talk about why, hey, what do you think about going to this community? How do you think art can work with this? Because then you are empowering someone who will empower the community. You don't want to do that. So you disrupt that. And so, I mean, as an artist, as a politician, I'm always trying to, as a strategist in policy, I'm always trying to get money to people. I'm constantly putting money in people's hands. I love doing that. As an artist, I'm always disrupted by, oh, hey, wait around, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was, I'm curating every, fall, every summer, and I'm always throwing money at people as much, as much as I can. And every year I find that money gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. Dwindles and dwindles. <laughs> but I still try to do it. As an artist, I'm just going to keep doing it because I don't know any better. And I know that we are voices for people who don't, who cannot be heard. And we have to tell them stories. And I have my own story to tell as well. But someone else in the room may go, oh, that's mine as well. And that, that can affect me. And I'm a fan. Um, things like this, I love because I get to be a fan. And I can go, yeah, that works for me. And it moves me. Right. I never had to um, steal a grape, but I may have stolen. The, I have stolen a car. So it's always something. It's something Allegedly, right. no, no, they did it. I, oh. I, I'm past the seven years. I'm good. Uh, Winter, you want to answer that question? Or? That was so long ago. <laughs> what it was a long. What time was ago. it? Was it something about arts and? Sorry. Yeah. No. 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 no you're good. Um, you're I was good. just asking, like, what based on sort of Toni Morrison's prompt of now being the time of when an artist should really stand up despite the danger of it because it's very dangerous right now I mean I feel like Lisa and I have had conversations about just like content and how you're being monitored you're being blacklisted Shadow you're Bay. being you know shadow exactly like you know there's a, a, a artist um she's a comedian can't think of her name right now and I know who she is you all know who she is she was on Insecure um, Amanda, Seals. Amanda Seals, thank you. Amanda Seals, early on in the uh, uh, God, um, in the um, Hamas Israeli government dynamic, she had spoken simply, I think, just about ceasing genocide, like ceasing fire, and she was removed from her agents. Her agents dropped her, like immediately. So, and her not even being aware of it until she got the call, like, "Hey, did you hear? You just dropped, you know, whatever." And so I just, I'm using that just as an example of how incredibly curious this time is. And that even tonight, I'm sure, is monitored, right? Because like, what are they saying? Are they gonna say something that's gonna disrupt something? Whatever, right? I think for me, there's not that much of a difference between the way I live my life and the way I make my art. Mm. And so, um, you know, my Facebook posts or Instagram posts are not that different from what my characters are saying. I'm writing about the same things. I'm writing about what I'm thinking about and what I'm wondering about and what I want to change. So there's not um, there's not a huge disconnect. And as we were sitting here, I was thinking, I didn't realize that I had an optimistic streak but I'm still writing plays. Mm -hmm. Nobody is asking me to write those plays. Not one. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares if I write another play. Just me. So that must take a certain level of optimism mm. to do it anyway. And there's the hope. Maybe it'll go here or go there, but there's no direct path. There's nothing that says that it will happen. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think I don't know how to communicate what I want for us in any other way. Like, I do like journalism. I did work for the New York Times. But if I look at what the New York Times is doing 
right now, I would have a really hard time living my principles. So it means I live and you know, there's a great amount of instability with the way that I live and I depend on community in order to make it through. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a constant disappointment of seeing institutions uh, or people in power make choices mm -hmm. that are so harmful and to have to live with those consequences and have to keep going. And, you know, the, as soon as, um, uh, you know, Hamas had uh, dropped their bombs and I, I posted on Facebook and I, I've been posting about Palestine for, years. I don't know, years, years. And I, I went to Palestine because I didn't know what I didn't know. I was raised, you know, I went to Quaker school, but um, I was born Jewish and I just didn't know. I got fed the thing of like Israel, they just, and I was like, oh, like, and what I wondered as a kid was if I lived in Israel, what kind of person would I be? Like, would I be brave? Would I be putting myself on the line? And at that time I thought, yeah, yeah, I just, I just need something to believe in and I'll fight. And what I realized today is I'm not a hero. I'm only fighting in so much as my comfort level can take it. So this question of would I be a good German or a bad German that we look at and we compare ourselves now, I realize that I would be good to no one. I would be too afraid to keep a family in my house. And if I ran, I wouldn't be helping anybody. And so what would make me different than anyone who was like, I guess this is what I have to do. And I think the outcome would be different. I don't know that I would survive doing what people did, that kind of harm to other people. But if I really, if I truly was heroic, I would be taking people into my house. They would be living with me. And I would I would do that. But I'm not. So I have to accept that level of um, hypocrisy that I will go so far, but not further. And that's what I'm living with. That's what my lens is. I'm looking around and saying like, okay, in that story, who would I be? And when I was doing in Darfur, uh, I was having um, an argument with someone who was involved in the same thing. And I was saying, I don't know that I wouldn't be a member of the John Joweed. Because if you take away my food and you promise me $200 and I need to feed my family, I don't know that I would refuse that. And the other person was like, no, I can never be a John Joweed. I just, I couldn't. And I'm like, I cannot say what I would not do. And I think that that is a really good question to continually ask ourselves is, what am I doing? What would I do? What am I not doing? And just to know it, just to not pretend that there's something going on that isn't. Right. And it doesn't mean that I have to walk around hating myself or feeling guilty. It just means that I'm looking in the mirror and saying, okay, this is who you are and this is how you are. What do you want to do with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Maybe, yes. maybe one of the, just to pick up on this idea, because, you know, Winter, you bring up a good point of you're only able to go so far in your own, as an individual, like, you know, there's your comfort, you bump up against your comfort level and whatnot. There's a great podcast, um, an episode that I heard, and because I, I don't want to take credit for an idea that I didn't have. No, 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 no. Um, 
but it's called Movement Memos with Kelly Hayes. I don't know if you guys have ever heard it, but she had a great, uh, there's an episode on where she talks to this guy who teaches survival skills. And he's like, how do we survive the apocalypse? It's not going to be with, you know, um, you know, the the singular person who's going to lead us through like the one man with a particular set of skills or anything like that. It's not going to be that. It is going to be in community because she says, if you look at, sort of like Native American, and she's Native American, I think she's an, um, a Minimi, uh, of the Minimi tribe. Um, she's like, our history is that when there is famine or something, the first thing we do is make sure everybody has some place to live and something to eat, because ultimately we're safer when everybody has something. So that it's like good that we six are like seven are good, but y'all ain't got food, we're in danger. Right. And so she's just like, and it was not a thing that it was like, not a thing in which, oh, we loved everybody who was in that group, but we knew that we were, our chances for long term survival were better if we worked together and took care of everybody. So back to your thing is like, perhaps if we are in community and able to model those types of behaviors that we would like to see, then maybe collectively we're able to stand and do the right thing for a little bit longer than if we were just left to our own devices and left up to like, well, it's me and my family on the line. Well, maybe if it's all of us, maybe we can stand together a little longer. Not a perfect solution, but maybe it gets us a little further and through the situation than if we stood by ourselves. I appreciate that. Um, I want to, Lisa, I want you to respond to the question around the artist of it all. And then I have one last question for Saeed, and then I want to open it up for a couple of questions, and then we'll end the night. Um, what we're doing here now is so essential. Community is so essential. Um, what you um, said, Rob, about, you know, when we all have, we're safer. And we've been so, um, you know, particularly in this empire, so individualistically driven um, that now we're at a critical point where we have to come together and form community. And so, you know, as a, a spirit child daughter of Nina Simone, who said that, you know, it's the responsibility of the artist to speak to the times in, you know, concert with what, um, you know, Mama Tony said. Um, you know, I've always used my art to speak truth to power. It's just how I'm wired. And so I understand that there's also, um, you pay a toll. Like if, if, you, if you're if you an artist and, and, and you're in the moment and you speak to the times and you, and you speak from the, from the passion and the pain and the truth and the rage, which is where, um, you know, my, my art is fertilized in, in pain and, and anger and, 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 and love and love. Um, and imagination, um, there's a price, you know, that 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 you pay, um, you know, because and especially now that we're living in the time of McCarthyism, you know, you do pay a price, you know, there are prices to be paid. So, and then if you don't, if you decide to, you know, take the other route, which is to, you know, not speak and to not make waves and to and to and to not, um, you know, uh, disrupt or um, disturb or um, you know, offend empire and all of the tentacles of empire in media and entertainment and uh, you know, uh, you know, politics and academia, wherever you live, if you're deciding to be mute, you, you pay a toll for that too. Your spirit pays a toll for that. Your soul pays a toll for that. There's a piece of your integrity that pays a toll for that. So it's just a matter of deciding what toll are you willing to pay because we all have to pay a toll. So what toll are you willing to live with? You know, and I've made my choice of the toll that I'm willing to pay. And if I, you know, my, my job is to rattle empire. My, that, 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 that is who I am, I'm so clear. Um, but that's not every artist. You know, I'm speaking from the, you know, from, from the artist tribe. Um, but in being in community right now, in this moment, we are being called to be in community, to come together like this. This is why I'm so glad you're having this, so that we can share stories of empathy and, you know, maybe hearing someone puts a battery in your back and there's, or, or you know that, oh, if there's a community here where I can, you know, uh, uh, you know, find um, uh, comfort and, and courage 
and information and the energy to to go forth and be be brave in this really scary, terrifying, horrifying, and hopeful time that we're in. So community is so essential. You know, it's it's when we have to be intentional with with creating community, like you all coming out tonight is was intentional and that doesn't escape me that we're here, you know, that you pulled this together and we're talking in this moment um, in the midst of, of, of genocides, because there are genocides all over the globe. Ain't nobody so talking about we, Haiti. Right, right. And, 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 and we are, but, but to that point, we are talking about Congo. We are talking about Sudan. We are talking about Haiti and we're talking about Gaza and Palestine. And I think what's so important is that we have, we're seeing it live stream. So if, if, if Haiti's live stream, if Congo is live stream, if Sudan is live stream, we're getting snippets of it, but we're getting it on a daily. We're getting the images from Gaza that it has to shake your soul and not just hear the numbers, but to see the actual babies and mothers and fathers and human beings connected to those numbers, which is still happening in Haiti and, and Congo and Sudan too. We're not seeing it. We're not seeing the, the, the real, you know? So it's, I just think that Gaza and Palestine is the linchpin of the dominoes for us to connect the dots to Congo, to Haiti, to Sudan, so that we can say, hey, wait, this is not the world, the planet that we desire, that we want to live on. We want life all over. We want to enter colonialism and all of this brutality all over. And right now, I feel that it's Gaza and Palestine, which is the test for all of us to come together as a community and say, we will not uh, c continue to have a planet where there is constant destruction and, and, and um, hate and violence and death, just absolute, you know, wanton death. It's, we cannot sustain this all over, all over. And I'm, I'm just named four, four places and it's all over. And this is the moment that we're in. So I think it's so important for artists and all of us to use our instrument however we can. Yeah, yeah, no, I so appreciate that. Um, uh, one, one last question for Saeed. And then I'm gonna open it up for you guys if you if you have any questions. Um, so in the film Letting Go, um, the young um was the first one was that I was the first yeah, with yeah. the young girl and the infant. And she her mother obviously is sort of you know, sort of not well or self-medicating, and she ends up taking the kid onto the train and the door shuts. When I first saw that, my reaction was like, oh my God, like somebody stopped the train. But then sort of took a pause. I was like, wait a minute, maybe that was intentional. Maybe she was intentionally trying to find someone else to be humane or capable of humanity because she wasn't and her mom wasn't, right? Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's another level of things that are happening on the planet outside of just sort of these micro issues around global war and geopolitics. And I'm speaking to you particularly because I know your, your writing tends to interrogate the micro inside the home. And, mm -hmm the micro inside the community. And so I'm just very, and love the excerpt that you read and I love that, that memoir, I've read it obviously, but can you speak just a little bit to why it's important for you to step kind of, not necessarily intentionally, maybe it is intentionally, but away from the macro and focus simply on the micro and how that's revolutionary. Okay, great question. And by the way, Keith knows me very well. I've known Keith almost 30 years now. So he it's knows- not been no 30. Yes, I have. I've known you since 1996. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh my God, it's been 30 years? Receipts so, pulled. That's yeah. called 30. 28 is closer to 30 than 15. What? Okay. See, but Keith got a B in math. That's why he couldn't do <laughs> I, I, So I, Keith I, knows what questions to ask. He, you know, you, yes. Um, I mean, listen, from the excerpt I read, as you know, I was raised in a, in a political household um, from from four years old, I was I was incredibly conscious of what was happening in the world. My mother made sure that I knew of all the all of the ills. But Keith brings up a great point, which is so when it gets to the art, what I'm trying to express, and I used to, I always felt I had to, I had a mission, I had to make my parents proud. So I needed to like everything had to be about the communist 
It was about communism, the revolution. It had to all be about that. It had to be whatever I was going to do, whatever kind of art. It had to be with that objective in mind. And then I realized um, that my the characters I was writing were not three dimensional characters. They were they were mouthpieces for an idea. And listen, okay, see, I'm gonna tie it all together now. The humanity, we're going back to the humanity question, the first one, it was where was their humanity um, that I could not just be beholden to ideas and concepts. I needed to look, as you said, at the micro. Um, and I think if you read my work, well, you know, the, obviously with the memoir, it's, it's I, go, I go big and I go small. I mean, it's about, a, it's about world events, but it's also about how does it impact the individual I also want to give a shout out to Winter over there because you are you're pointing out. Let me imagine myself in a different situation, and maybe I won't be the maybe I'm not going to be the good guy. Maybe I wouldn't be the good guy in that situation, and I think that's a very valid, valuable thing to, to because it's like now let's talk about our imperfections and um, uh, of the we have these noble ideas, but maybe we can't live up to them. Maybe we subvert them. Um, so, so Keith has known me since you know when we were first. I was first starting out as a writer, and I, I you know, I went into therapy. My therapist was a huge. He had a huge influence on um, trying to get me to look at what my family, my family dynamic, had done to impact because everything was always about politics i blamed everything on it was all about the politics it was all this it was all right. that and you remember that right you were there Keith. You were there. <laughs> so um but he had me you know look inward but i mean i think you know i i think it's um it's in my bones that i will always write things that speak to the world but i have to do it through the individual i have to do it through so I, and i and i actually love taking it I'm going back to when I love going from a different angle often going from the one that's like, Oh, we wouldn't expect. Yeah. I was raised to hate the boss. So I, one of my, my favorite things to do is actually try to write a character from the boss's point of view to actually just try to see it through their eyes to try to make them a person. Um, so that's <laughs> not always easy, but I do. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's yeah. I yeah. appreciate that. Really appreciate that. I appreciate the question. Yes, of course, of course. So, um, I'm going to open it up. If you guys have any questions for any of the artists um, here, um, or anything that you saw, um, by all means, speak now. What, Mike, Mike. Yes, give Gozi. <clears throat> she doesn't really need a mic. I can project. Hi. Um, I was wondering, Keith. What made you think of curating this particular night in this way? Like with all the things that you were sort of absorbing, I'm sure of as of late, when I witnessed in the last decade or so, like there's an like urgent moment and you're like, we gotta galvanize and create. And so I, I, I'm really interested in like, what made you think about curating it in this particular way? Um, very good question. I think in the past, like from Facing Our Truth, which is a response to Trayvon, Martin to um, Hands Up, which was a response to black male and, and women's bodies being policed. Um, then I feel like things were much more easier to grasp and understand. It was very singular. And in the last, I feel like the last year, the last six, eight months, there's so many things like I couldn't even, I mean, I was watching the news. I was like, I can't even take in all this information. This is way too much information. And then I have friends from all walks of life who um, in all sort of demographic experiences who all, you know, hit me up and they have their own particular issue around Haiti or it's, it's Chad or it's, it's Gaza or it's friends of mine who actually have family in Israel. And it's like, you know, my dad in Cincinnati and then it's like my brother in Atlanta and his sister's kids and his wife's kids or whatever. It's just so many things were happening at once. I was like, well, the only thing I can do, the only thing I want to do is gather a group of people to talk about what's on our minds right now, to figure out a way to sort of define the common denominator. And I thought, well, maybe the common denominator is humanity. Like, maybe we just sort of question humanity for ourselves. Like, maybe that's the thing that needs to be sort of like unpacked, undressed, or 
dressed up for the first time, you know? And I really appreciate just anytime there are people who are willing to be accountable for their own inability to fix it all. Because the part of me also, went, I'm a Capricorn, so I'm kind of like, okay, I can fix it. Move out the way, right? I wasn't able to think that way anymore. I was like, I can't even fix this. I can't even provide the normal sense of stability that I even can provide myself. So it's like, now is the time to bring people together. I really need community right now. I really need to hear from other people meaningfully because I love people in general, but I'm saying like right now seems really particularly important. So to answer your question, that is the reason. Um, in and then I think we'll shut it down. Unless somebody else. Oh, oh, I wrote down a few of the things that you guys brought up. Um, as a <laughs> don't don't listen to him. That's what he does all the time. So you guys mentioned um, opening dialogue and engendering courage, and um, you know speaking in a way and 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 doing things, carrying uh, yourself in a way that would embolden uh, the arts and. Uh, uh, just free thinking and free uh, uh, conveying of your ideas and feelings. What what advice would you give to a new curator um, as far as um, opening opening the way to do that, or um, this this segue from someone feeling like, oh, maybe I should shield my thoughts and feelings to, oh, I can. This is a safe place for that. I'm going to tackle that with you. Um, I'm going to say it a lot. One thing I would talk to you a lot about is having your intentions, knowing why you're doing it. There's a, um, a lot of people who just will create and they're creating great work. I find that a lot of the work that resonates is when your intent, not the intention of the work, but your intentions personally. Why am I doing this type of, why am I curating this space? Like he just said, his intentions were building this um, small community's cohort. It came from something, and his intentions were pure. I, I think I think we all can agree that he had pure intentions here. That's one way. It's really, um, uh, what's the word? Grounding yourself in the why. The why is very important. And people may not may not agree with your why, and that's fine. But you knowing why you're working out and doing this this composition and why you're creating this work has an effect on others and will attract the people who need to hear it and need to see it, or, or and or be involved. One, one thing I will just say, and this is, you know, apropos of like nothing specific here, but we've talked about, you know, the way forward and the thing that I want to just make sure everybody walks out of here knowing is that there is, there really is already, as you've seen here, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There is incredible art being created right now across disciplines. And you can take solace in that if you need to figure out, oh, like, how do I deal with the crazy world? Go see some art, <laughs> visual art, theater, books, film, music is out there right now. Dance, it, it's out there. And why that is important is, you know, I'll take this back to the, the scholar Robin D.G. Kelly, who said that, you know, we're always really clear about what we want to tear down but we're often not as clear about what we want to build. So we really need to be thinking about what, how do we feed our imagination and the arts are what do that. And so that's the way forward. Again, that my two I love that. Well, unless there's any other questions, I think we should end on that note. <laughs> because <laughs> that was a, a beautiful seed to plant. So thank you. So again, thank you everybody for being here. Again, let me just thank Winter Miller, Ty Allen, Rob Fields, Saeed Sarabazade, Lisa Jesse Peterson, and all the other artists. And please clap for, yes. and please clap for Keith, everyone, please. Yes. The loud thank applause for Keith, bring us together. Thank you very much. Uh, until next time, thank you, Siegel Theater. Thank you, Teresa. Right.